they're going to get political permission to do QE4. Now, when talking about this complete collapse of the U.S. economy, it's easy to blame the Federal Reserve and the government for causing the collapse. And definitely, it seems like they've played a big role. I mean, the policies they've made seem to have caused the collapse to happen. But isn't it also the American people's fault, the public's fault, our fault for letting them do this? Oh, yes and no. I This is a very thorny topic. Uh, we talked about this before going on the air. Uh, I, I have a few points I'd like to make. I, I've been very critical of the U.S. population as really not catching on to what's going on and buying a lot of lies and not preparing itself. But I, I do blame the public for its apathy. Think of it this way. You know, if you live in, <clears throat> if you live in California somewhere, let's just say San Francisco or San Diego or L.A., you, you're going to be concerned about your city. You're going to be concerned about your state. But damn, it's hard to be concerned and, and follow and affect change for the federal government. The states, I mean, California itself is like the, the, the eighth biggest economy or seventh biggest economy in the world. So it could be a country. It's very difficult to follow the federal, the federal uh, activity. Very, very difficult. And especially when you've got lobbying groups with, with powerful amounts of money, that, that you cannot stop these things. How do you stop the government when they says, say, we're going to do this because uh, we've got uh, armed conflict involved and, and we need to participate. We need to send in troops. We need to protect the U.S. borders. How do you co combat a, a nation that tries to define what the terrorists and security threats are. These are all very, very difficult. So there's a lot of apathy, a lot of ignorance, a lot of gullibility, and we're just overwhelmed. Uh, look at what happened with Occupy Wall Street. They were kind of treated, uh, not kind of, they were treated as a terrorist organization, a terrorist movement. And, and you know, that, that cannot stand in our society. You, you must have a feedback mechanism for the people to let their voice be heard, or else there is no democracy. And I think in the United States, there's no democracy. I mean, I'd like to see a referendum on dissolving the Congress. Let me repeat that. I'd like to see a national referendum to dissolve the Congress and have a new constitutional Congress that eliminates lobbying. Look, look at the financial regulation bill. Financial Regulatory Bill, they call it Dodd-Frank. It started up in 2009, and its final form was pretty much written by Goldman Sachs and Citibank. Why is that? Because they control the committee. How do they control the committee? With tremendous campaign funds, bribery, threats. The, the final FinReg bill had no resemblance with the original. There were a lot of compromises made along the way, like, oh, let's keep in the... Uh, the forced audit of the Fed that Ron Paul wanted. Let's leave that in. So they had the audit, and it revealed $23 trillion in near 0% interest loans to the owners of the Federal Reserve and their friends. And my joke was, well, with $23 trillion, they're going to collapse the world economy and buy it up. Now, okay, I, I blame them for continuing to place hope in the next puppet in power. I say these are narco puppets wearing a blue coat or a narco puppet wearing a red coat. I don't pay any attention to, to political party. I mean, is Obama really all that different from Bush? Did we stop the wars? Did we stop the banking fraud? I don't think so. We didn't really do much of anything except bring in Obamacare, which is itself a hidden agenda for financial asset declarations, for maybe a wet blanket on the economy. I heard Obama's mission in 08 was to destroy the dollar and wreck the U.S. economy. And I think he's done a superb job for his masters. Okay, so we have <clears throat> endless predatory wars, no recovering economy, and uh, I don't think we have any addressed problems. Uh, here's where I think it's no. We're not to blame because it's difficult to rectify the government, difficult to to, to stop corruption in high office. Can the people really force an impeachment of Eric Holder 
the attorney general, well, he finally left under sufficient, you know, cause for, I don't know, 80 years in prison with 15 indictment charges, 15 felony charges that would come if, if he were ever taken to court. You know, how do you stop the takeover of the U.S. Treasury Department by Goldman Sachs that took place in 1992 with the, the installation of, uh, I guess it was 94 that Robert Rubin came in. Uh, how do you stop that? How do you prevent the Occupy Wall Street from being infiltrated and attacked by the FBI? I, 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 don't, know, I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you stop it. Um, how do you stop the slick anti-gold propaganda? Well, you just ignore it. Okay, they say it's a, a dead asset. It earns no it earns no interest income. Well, sure it does if you want to do what Warren Buffett did. He he was writing covered call. He was doing covered calls, writing calls against his large silver position, and he got called away. So he lied about it on the income side, and then doubly lied about it when he got called away. So Berkshire Hathaway owns no silver. And that was the beginning of the SLV, Barclays Bank-based fund for silver. That's right. The SLV fund came from Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett's huge investment of 129 million ounces of silver. That's its origin. You know, how do you stop increased taxation? How do you stop increased payments required for Social Security and Medicare? These are things that are extremely difficult to, to halt. How do you stop, you know, the, the job security threats? I, I don't know. Uh, start an online business. But, you know, these things are very difficult. So that's, uh, you know, that's my yes and no for is the public to blame. Now, moving forward here, you discussed a little bit in your article about how China's influence in America is increasing. You said that you think possibly China could be purchasing a stake in the Federal Reserve itself and that China has been active in converting their toxic U.S. debt paper to commercial properties and farmlands, possibly also to mining properties and port facilities. So what is China's strategy as you see it? We had some very unusual events late last year. Um, a Chinese property conglomerate took over. Um, the prices is, is very difficult to, to be clear about, but they took over the JP Morgan headquarters. I mean their huge gold vault, the largest private vault in the world. Uh, China also took over the, what is it, 70 story, 60 story, 50 story JP Morgan headquarter building. They also took over uh, other smaller buildings that include the conference center. The price reported was something like seven hundred million dollars, and you know that might have been, you know, exclusive of other payments or something. I, I don't know the exact price, but to me, it looked like a real fire discount that smelled like an asset seizure on a default. So th there's a very big story behind that, and I've got a theory that on the back end of the most favored nation status given to China in 1999 was a gold lease of Mao Zedong era gold, uh, a very large gold lease. And I don't know exactly how much it was. It might have been something on the order of 4,000 tons. And to secure that, <clears throat> to secure the gold lease, it, it was like, okay, China will invest in, in your reindustrialization in the, from, from Western money. And, and China said, okay, we'll go along then with leasing you some gold. And then the Chinese said, well, we don't really trust you. We want some collateral uh, on this gold lease. So we're going to attach the J.P. Morgan headquarter property. And anyone back then in 2001 who might have thought that J.P. Morgan would lose its headquarters property would be called a fool, a moron, and the psycho. Yet it happened. So what's going on? I believe the Federal Reserve now has a new majority stakeholder investor, and that is China. Now that's a pretty big pill to swallow. There are other details. 
Every major U.S. city, I don't have a complete list, but it certainly includes Chicago, Dallas, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco. Every U.S. major city has a significant Chinese ownership of its commercial properties. I'm hearing that in just the last two or three years, the proportion of New York commercial property owned by China has gone from 30% to 60%. Okay, so what is going on? I think we've got a situation in the United States where the U.S., because of its uncontrollable debt, has lost its sovereignty. With outsourcing, it's lost its industry. And with the mortgage foreclosures, a lot have lost their homes. And we are in the process of losing our self-determination I believe the Chinese now control a good deal of the U.S. monetary policy related to the dollar. There's a, bit, a lot of debate whether it's the U.S. Federal Reserve or the global Federal Reserve with, with authority over the dollar, which is a global entity. The dollar is used in global trade. So, okay, fine. Control, the Fed controls policy for the dollar in the United States, but it also controls policy for dollars that float across the world. I believe the Chinese are keeping the United States propped, keeping it going, even after perhaps the U.S. government debt defaulted last year. I'll repeat that. I believe it's very possible the U.S. government debt defaulted last year. The hint was they announced that there was no more debt limit. Why not? Well, it's not relevant anymore if you have a bankruptcy and default. So maybe what we've done is entered a new stage with the Chinese taking controlling interest of the Fed, controlling a lot of the policy and controlling a lot of the liquidation and diversification out of the, the Treasury bonds, for instance, paying for massive uh, industrial parks in New York and California and Idaho, those are the three centers I keep hearing about. And here's, here's how they're doing it. Uh, the U.S. government doesn't want to see, okay, look at that, the Chinese just plopped down $3 billion and, and they bought you know a, a quarter of Detroit. We don't want that. So what they do is they use, uh, not a shell, but they use a front. They use Wells Fargo as a front. And then the Chinese come in and, and with, the, with their collateral of treasury bonds, they borrow a lot of money from Wells Fargo. Remember, they're supposed to have $1.3 trillion in treasury bonds. I'll be really surprised if they have more than $700 or $800 billion, but that's a lot of money. So they move a chunk of it into Wells Fargo, borrow against it, and start, buy, start buying up huge commercial properties in the U.S. major cities. So that's what I think is going on. And they're going to keep this thing propped up until they're no longer able to buy gold or commercial properties in the United States. Who owns the Long Beach, California port facility? China. Who owns the biggest Vancouver port facility in Canada? China. Who owns the Port Ritchie port facility in British Columbia? China. You know, just do a little homework and you see that they own quite a lot of port facilities, including almost all of the Australian port facilities. So they're busy with their treasury bond purchases. They're buying up significant properties in Africa. This is very deep. I, I, think, I think behind the scenes, China is really running a lot of U.S. foreign policy and, and they tolerate some of the BS like you know, disputes over the islands with Japan, and between China and Japan, they, they tolerate that. And they're starting not to tolerate the U.S. interference in Hong Kong with demonstrations. So remember, it's the privilege of the creditor nation to manage the assets, to dictate what assets are purchased, like in the U.S., you know, buildings, industries, constructed new industrial parks, all industrial parks are located, Chinese ownership in the United States, are located next to railway facilities. But the, the part that's going to hurt most coming up in this Chinese exercise is redirected output. And, and, and here, here's a, a hint. 
I, f I found this to be in extremely interesting, if not intriguing, back in uh, you know early September or so, just doing my regular research from the newsletter. I found that uh, a significant portion of U.S. farm-based hay feed, hay feed used to feed livestock and horse, horses, horses and cattle, the hay feed was being exported to China. Okay, how much? Well, not a little bit. I don't have the actual numbers in front of me. I, I think it was something like 10% of all the hay feed was exported to China. And now the price of hay feed in the United States is going up as there's less supply. It's a nice little microcosm example of what happens when you lose control of your assets. You lose control of the directed output. It doesn't go to U.S. farms. It goes to Chinese livestock in China. So if China, for instance, buys up a bunch of big agribusiness, big farm businesses, in Portugal, Spain, Italy, and France, do you think they're going to redirect the output to China and cause shortages in the pigs nations of Southern Europe? Notice that these Southern European nations are under deep distress. So do you think China might have objected to the Russian sanctions? No, it works perfectly, dovetails with their plans, perhaps, to buy up European farms. They're going to buy up American farms. They already are. So remember, the, these, these Chinese industrial parks are, are going to be a, a grand experiment. Uh, I don't know how it's all going to play out, but I think the experiment is going to include importing Chinese labor. And a good example of that was seen here in Costa Rica. They, they brought in about 3,000 workers to build the national soccer football stadium in San Jose, Costa Rica. There was zero Costa Rican labor involved. Zero. I went there on successive Sundays because I do a little bike tour, very little uh, traffic in the main roads, and that means very little risk of getting knocked off by a taxi or some clown uh, driving. But I, I would go around and take pictures of the stadium in progress. It took about, I don't know, 16 months to construct. I actually tried to talk with a couple of Chinese workers. They were in orange jumpsuits, which I concluded meant that they were prisoners. Uh, and they spoke no English and no Spanish. So we used sign language. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, you know, they didn't. I was looking all through their little groups, you know, mixing cement and porting off, you know, steel pipes and, you know, welders with their caps and walking around. And I looked, did I see any Latino face? No, zero. They're all Chinese. So this is what's going to happen in the industrial parks in the United States. Uh, they're buying up slowly, neighborhood by neighborhood. I'm not talking about blocks. I'm talking about groups of blocks in Detroit. Detroit is seeing its water cut off and electricity cut off, and the Chinese come right in there to buy up the vacant properties. Wow, we're seeing a colonization commercially, commercially of the United States by China. <clears throat> so they're buying a stake of the Fed. They're converting their U.S. government debt paper and their mortgages. I believe the Lehman event had a couple of factors behind it. Uh, Goldman Sachs was in at a, a high risk of financial failure, and the Chinese were dumping their Fannie Mae bonds. Same time, and, and Goldman Sachs came in and said with J.P. Morgan, let's kill Lehman Brothers, let's capitalize on the event, let's nationalize AIG, and let's give ourselves 100 cents on the dollar when no one else does on these uh, derivatives that, that now the government is in charge of, namely Goldman Sachs. So Go Goldman Sachs basically commandeered policy of AIG. Now this is all very ugly. I, I don't think you can find a, a significant slice of the American financial structure that's not corrupted to the core. And that includes United Way and other charities. United Way, gosh, what is it, 96 cents on the dollar goes to administrative costs? I mean, you, you can look at any major section, pharmaceuticals, banks, television networks, you name it, corrupted to the core. You were talking about before how the U.S. government isn't really a democracy anymore. It doesn't reflect what the people want. 
And it seems like with China having more influence in the United States, isn't government policy and monetary policy going to reflect more and more, not what the people want, but what maybe the Chinese government wants? Yeah, I think the Chinese are going to try to maintain the, the official policy, uh, which obviously includes the monetary side with the Fed, but might include some foreign policy, might include some fiscal policy, you know, interior to the United States regarding taxation and whatever. The Chinese are going to have a voice because they're the major debt uh, I'm sorry, the major creditor. I mean, t take just give yourself an example. Suppose Sears is approaching bankruptcy and the three major banks serving as creditors, they meet with the officials of Sears to decide on policy. The creditors take over the board. At the national level, the creditor nations for the government debt take over control in a hidden way the finance function, the Department of Treasury. So I don't think China minds the sanction against Russia because it's resulting in uh, perhaps opportunities for China to buy up Southern European farms. I don't think the Chinese mind keeping the interest rate derivatives in place to support the Treasury bonds because that way China can continue to redeem their bonds in buying a huge, say, copper mine in Chile or Angola, Africa or Tanzania. Chinese are very active in, uh, in Zimbabwe now. Okay, well, why would the Chinese object for a to a policy that enables them to dump more treasury bonds and convert them to commercial buildings in the United States and to mining properties across the world? Why would they object to... Uh, keeping the treasure bond propped when they want to use it to expand the Brazilian port facility that extends three miles into the ocean. No, they, they like this. Elijah, they, they like it. They're buying the United States. They're colonizing the United States. This is, this is shocking what's happening. This is death of the nation. I've been saying it now for a year. The U.S. is going to be tremendously isolated. We're trying to isolate Russia and China. We're going to isolate ourselves from Europe. South America hates our guts. We've been assassinating their leaders for 30 years. We've been raping and pillaging Argentina. We had a war with Nicaragua. We used laser weapons and killed 200 people on the streets of Panama City. They hate our guts. We're going to isolate ourselves from Latin America, isolate ourselves from Russia and China. We're going to force Japan and Korea into their hands. And we're going to lose Europe because Europe is going to have a choice. Do we, do we join this alliance with Russia and China? Or do we allow our economy to just enter a, a dead zone like the Americans? Watch the British. They're going to be very interesting to watch because, you know, let's face it, most of the United States genetically and with, uh, you know, heredit heredity is, is, is British. It's white Anglo-Saxon Protestant stuff. And watch the British turn toward Russia and China. Uh, London does not want to go dark as a financial center. They don't want to have Hong Kong eclipse them. They don't want Frankfurt to rise up and eclipse London. I think Frankfurt is going to give London a real run for its money as a financial center and a RMB hub, which stands for Renminbi hub. Watch Frankfurt grow and grow and grow and, you know, threaten London functions, the big London banking center. But the RMB hub has two main purposes, and that is convert currencies to and from the Chinese Yuan and the other purpose is to provide a location and market for um, selling Chinese Yuan based bonds like say McDonald's does. I think there'll come a day when the United States finances some of its US government debt in Chinese Yuan currency and, and what does that provide the Chinese. It eliminates the currency risk. So if the Chinese want to become a 
more prominent reserve currency globally forced the United States to say underwrite, oh, I don't know, five or 10 percent of the U.S. government debt in Chinese yuan and sell the debt in London, Paris, Frankfurt, Hong Kong, and Shanghai. Wow. It's going to get very weird and very ugly and accelerate on the downside. Watch the big bankruptcies come in the next few months in the United States, starting with Sears. Sears is going to cause uh, a public relations problem for the United States because I grew up as a kid, I bought Craftsman's Tools. I didn't buy anything else. I bought a Porter Cable uh, drill set. And I thought, gosh, I hope this is good because it's, it's not Craftsman. Wow. I bought it on a, a liquidation sale in a department store. And I came to learn, pro no, Porter, Porter Cable is really good. Well, so is Makita. You know, so is DeWalt. There, there are lots of good ones now. Now, will Craftsman spin out and evade, avoid, step aside from the Sears black hole? I don't know, but it's going to cause a public relations problem because Sears is part of American culture as much as IBM. Going to get weird. Going to get really, 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 really weird. It's, it's weird already, but it's going to get weirder. All right. Well, Jim Willie, that's all we have time for today. But once again, thank you so much for joining us today. And people can find you at goldenjackass.com. Jim, thank you so much for your time. Okay. My pleasure. Bye now.